I bet the judge is going to say I'll allow it at some point in this hearing. I guarantee it. But after the last custody hearing, Michael was pretty worried about Jennifer. Objection, Your Honor. On what grounds? Hearsay. Nice try, Mrs. Florick. I'll allow. Go ahead. Nah, Mrs. Lewis. called it. Hey, Legal Eagles. D. James Stone here teaching you how to think like a lawyer. Today we're going to tackle one of the most requested TV shows out there, and that's The Good Wife. As one subscriber put it, it is the most highly rated legal TV show on Rotten Tomatoes, so that should stand for something. And fun fact, this is the most highly requested legal TV show from my mom. So, mom, I'm finally getting around to watching The Good Wife. I'm doing it for you. And be sure to stick around until the end, where I give this episode of The Good Wife a grade for legal realism and how accurate it is to real-life lawyering. So, uh, without any further ado, let's get started and dig right into The Good Wife. So we'll need some of you to help out with the lower-profile client work to free up our top litigators. Ed, you take the witness prep on highway redistribution. Don, you take the Brighton criminal. And Alicia will take the pro bono. Everyone else, your task is to show Schiffer and Marks our A-game, okay? Okay, so the main character is being assigned with pro bono work. It's not uncommon for large law firms to get a huge case. It's all hands on deck, so they really pull in all the bodies they can. Uh, and as the, the lawyer mentioned, it does tend to help with year-end bonuses. If you work a lot of billable hours, then you'll get a lot of, uh, of year-end bonuses. But the main character is uh, getting assigned pro bono. Now, pro bono, uh, as you may know, is uh, work that's provided by a law firm for free. Usually it's for indigent clients, but generally law firms, and sometimes it's mandated by the state, have to do a certain number of pro bono hours per year. It's a way for the law firm to give back, and it's a way to help uh, those who can't afford really expensive uh, lawyers and, and legal services, the lawyers will provide that for free and that's called pro bono. So it looks like everybody else is being thrown on this huge class action, whereas the main character is being given the leftover pro bono work, which is not uncommon. So, Will speaks highly of you. He says you graduated top of your class at Georgetown. When was this? 15 years ago. Uh -huh. And you spent two years at Crozier, Abrams and Abbott. Good firm. Will says you clocked the highest billable hours there. Why'd you leave? Okay, that's a funny throwaway line. They're trying to imply that the main character is a really diligent worker. The way it works at really big law firms is that the lawyers are all on salary. So at the end of the year, they'll all take home the same amount, except if... Uh, they, there's a big bonus and the way that you get a big bonus is by clocking a large number of hours Not every hour that you work at a law firm uh, brings in money to the law firm or to you personally as a lawyer And it's only when you're in a, a much smaller firm does every hour that you bill go directly into your pocket in large law firms all the attorneys uh, billable hours go into a general pot that's divided based on the salary and th so th they're saying that she back in the day when she was in private practice, uh, was billing more than anybody else. And in real life, uh, certainly someone has to bill more hours than everybody else, but those numbers uh, can be very, very high, somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000 billable hours uh, per year. I would say for every three to four billable hours you're in the office, you're probably not billing at least one of those hours, whether you're eating lunch or eating dinner, if you're really staying late, uh, or you know, you're just taking a break. There are lots of times when you're in the office and you're not billing. So to bill the highest number of billable hours in a firm is both a, a badge of honor and sort of a dubious mark that she's just a really, really hard worker and good for the firm, but not necessarily good for her personal life. So that's an interesting little tidbit that they threw in there. Jennifer Lewis, 26 years old, taught second grade, accused of killing her ex-husband. Prosecution thought it was a slam dunk 45 years, but the jury came back last week deadlocked. Six jurors voted to convict, six not. I'm not even sure why the state attorney is retrying, except he wants justice. He wants to prove himself. So stick with my strategy from the first trial. The police focused on Jennifer so early in the investigation, they never even looked for the carjacker. What she's talking about there is that uh, when in jury trial, you generally have 12 jurors. Uh, that's why the famous movie is called 12 Angry Men, because back in the day, they were all men. Uh, now that's obviously not the case, which is a good thing. 
But to convict someone, you have to get all 12 jurors to vote to convict. If any one of those people refuses to vote to convict the individual, it's called a hung jury. Now that's different than if all 12 of the jurors say uh, not to convict or to acquit, uh, then the person just goes free and there's no way to retry them, generally speaking. Uh, here, uh, obviously, at least one of the jurors found that they couldn't find her guilty. The jury hung, and in that situation, the prosecutor has the ability to retry that individual at a later time. They go through the entire trial all over again. So that's apparently what's going on. This woman is going to be tried for a second time. Where's Diane? Diane asked me to step in for her. Jennifer, I'm Alicia Florick. I'm one of the other lawyers with the firm. Step in. For how long? For the retrial. Oh, my God. All rise. Ma'am. The criminal court of Cook County is now in session. The Honorable Judge Richard Cuesta presiding. Be seated. Okay, let's hear it. Your Honor, Your Honor I just... Your Honor, just to refresh your memory, the accused was deemed a flight risk due to an earlier custody hearing when she threatened to run off with her daughter. So that was a good tactic by the prosecutor here to take the lead and to educate the judge. Usually what happens when you make an appearance in court is the there's a huge docket, which means that there are maybe a dozen or so cases that have hearings to discuss that morning or that afternoon. So number one, the judge has a lot of different cases to deal with. Number two, it may have been weeks or months since you were last in the courthouse, especially if you're in state court uh, where there are just lots and lots of cases uh, continually churning. So uh, now the judge will probably take a look at the paperwork before taking the stand. But again, there may be a dozen or so cases that need, he, need, he or she needs to talk about that morning. So it's always a good idea to uh, take the initiative and to err on the side of providing more information to the judge than you would necessarily uh, give to someone who's very familiar with the case, because the judge might not remember that. Um, but I think it's also to show that the prosecutor is just kind of taking command and being a jerk, but we'll see. Just last week, a jury deadlocked on these murder charges six to six, Mr. Brody. Now, I know our new state's attorney wants to look tough, but why are you fighting this? In reality, if a jury hung six members of the jury to six, meaning six wanted to vote for uh, guilt and six wanted to acquit, it's very unlikely the prosecutor would try that case again. That means you have a really weak case. Usually a hung jury is one or two people, which means that with a different jury pool, you have a much better chance of conviction. But if you're uh, hanging the jury six to six, your case is weak and you probably don't want to try that one again. It's just a waste of the court's time at that point. If Mrs. Florick is so intent on getting a client out, why doesn't she agree to a speedy trial? <laughs> Mrs. Florick? Yes, Your Honor. The wife of the esteemed Peter Florick? Your husband and I never quite saw eye to eye, ma'am. Your Honor. Mrs. I Florick, don't talk. But if the prosecution thinks that this will in some way prejudice me against your client, he is sorely mistaken. Nice try, Matan. So, Ms. Lewis is granted pretrial release with electronic monitoring. She is restricted to temporary housing, attorney's offices, and transit in between. And given that this is a rerun, I'll set the trial date for the 25th. Now, are we all happy? Good. That's a little more tierce and crotchety than most judges are going to be. Judges know what's going on for the most part. When they see a new attorney, they're likely to be a little bit more lenient than this judge here. Although he is giving uh, the main character, Alicia, what she wants. So uh, he's sort of telling her, you're going to win this one, so just be quiet. Still... You want to command respect from all the lawyers, and so you don't want to be coming off as a crotchety old person, and so that's a little unrealistic. This hearing would probably take 10 to 15 minutes, not 30 seconds, but, you know, the outcome and the interchange is not crazy. A man came up to Michael. I didn't see the gun until... Do you need to take a break? Uh, no. Just if, if there was some water. Sure. Sonia, we need some water in here. It's gonna be about five minutes, but then I've gotta do his depot upstairs. <laughs> that secretary should definitely support an attorney who is conducting an interview of a criminal defendant. 
uh, that is going to trump whatever it is that she was working on at, at the moment. And also, it's not unusual for secretaries to support uh, three, four, and sometimes five attorneys in a major law firm. Uh, it's part of the cost-cutting measures that a lot of big firms use. It's actually not very difficult for assistants uh, to provide support to two different attorneys at the same time. And also, I don't know what she was supposed to do with the deposition. That's not something secretaries do. Anyway, all right, so Alicia's underwater, I guess. Can I ask you how many voted for conviction from the start, sir? 11. What? But there was only one holdout, juror number nine. We argued with her for three days. But the judge pulled the jury, and they deadlocked six to six. Yes, well, the judge would only declare us deadlocked if we were evenly split. So some of us agreed to change our vote to not guilty just to get out of there. If it hadn't been for juror number nine, we would have convicted. She didn't convince us. She exhausted us. Ooh, that, that's interesting. I've never heard of that happening, but that does sound like something that could happen. A judge has some discretion about when to declare a particular case as deadlocked, so it's possible that under some circumstances that the jury just wanted to go home and so that they would manipulate some of their votes to make it seem like a deadlock and everyone can get out of it. Um, that wouldn't be a good thing for our judicial system, but unfortunately, that sounds like something that's plausible because jurors are human beings too. Oh, and by the way, I don't pretend to know the entire body of American jurisprudence off the top of my head, so I may get things wrong from time to time. If you see a legal or factual inaccuracy, please leave me a comment down below. But if you do, please leave me a comment in the form of an objection. If you leave an objection, I will get to it and I will either sustain or overrule your objection. I look forward to seeing them. Just so I'm clear, the defense expert argued that the gunshot residue on Jennifer's hands came from the struggle. Oh, sweet. Is that why you held out? Oh, I don't know about that. I just tend to get a feeling. Don't I, Cyrus? Okay, that sounds a little crazy that a juror would base her decision based only on a feeling, but a juror can make their decision based on just about anything. And I remember uh, when I served on a jury when I was in law school, uh, in a criminal case, one of the jurors refused to convict because she felt her spirit wouldn't allow it, and she couldn't articulate any other reasons. Now. <laughs> the other jurors and I took a step back. We realized the woman was doing the best that she could, uh, and we talked it through, and eventually we all 12 decided on conviction on most of the counts at issue. But people make different decisions for different reasons, and that's part of the benefit of the jury system is that we may, it's a check and balance to make sure that the state doesn't overreach. But the downside is that sometimes you can get some really strange decision making um, going on behind the, the, the curtain of the jury. You know the new associate, Carrie? The one in the Brioni? What? I'm observant. Yes, the one in the Brioni. Brioni is a he type of He said to suit. me, may the best man win. What exactly does he mean by that? What he means is something I thought we weren't making public. What? Look, we only have one associate position open, so we agree to hire two applicants and in six months decide which one to retain. So this is a contest between me and Carrie? It was either that or a cage match. That would be highly unusual to hire two associates and then make them fight to the death, especially because associates can be profit centers for large law firms. They work a lot of hours and their salary is high compared to the national average, but it's actually low compared to the revenue that they're bringing in to the firm. So generally there's no real reason to make associates fight against each other. If you make an offer to someone at a large law firm, Generally, they can stick around for quite some time because they're good for the firm and, and there's no reason to get rid of them. It would also be highly unusual to tell the two associates that they're up against each other. You wouldn't want to create bad blood between those associates and all the other associates as well. So that's pretty unusual to say that two associates are going to fight to the death for their position. See, the computer automatically records the surveillance, marks it with date and time. Is that the night of the murder? Yeah. I mean, even if the computer did mismark it, I make an hourly tour of the lot and I didn't see no pickup truck. Look, that's me. 1103, just before the murder. Uh, can we get copies of these? Sure. Lady! 
Lainey! I like what these attorneys are doing, that they're going to the scene of the accident and they are personally investigating. Good attorneys conduct uh, written discovery very well. They'll ask questions on paper, they'll get a, a whole lot of documents, but a great attorney really digs in and checks all the things that they can to make sure that their case is as strong as possible or that the opponent's case is as weak as possible. And going to the scene of an accident or a crime is a great thing for an attorney to do. Not everyone will do that. So I really like what these attorneys are doing here and they're really getting into all the details that they can. Can you state your name? Cindy Lewis. And you were married to the victim for how long, Mrs. Lewis? Two years until... Get out of the well of the court. And how would you describe your husband's relationship? I bet the with judge his first is going to say I'll allow it at some point in this hearing. I guarantee it. Even, but after the last custody hearing, Michael was pretty worried about Jennifer. Objection, Your Honor. On what grounds? Hearsay. Nice try, Mrs. Florick. I'll allow. Go ahead. Nah, Mrs. Lewis. called it. Um, he was worried Jennifer was intent on getting sole custody. Thank you, Mrs. Lewis. Your witness. Now, Mrs. Lewis, you stated that Michael was worried about Jennifer, yet. In the week following. Objection, Your Honor. Sustained. Yeah, that was an argumentative question. In your testimony, Mrs. Lewis, you claim that Jennifer wanted sole custody. But isn't it true? Objection. Sustained. Yeah. Argumentative trying, again. Mrs. Florick, you'll hit on it. <laughs> That's cheeky of the judge, but they're they're right to object and the uh, right to sustain the objections. Mrs. Lewis, whose idea was it to have dinner? Jennifer's or Michael's? Uh, Michael's. So wouldn't that suggest that his attitude had changed towards Objection. Jennifer? Sustained. That one calls for speculation about what someone else was thinking. Uh, that's And also phrased in sort of an argumentative way. She's combining two different things together to try and create an argument through the questioning. What She, she can ask leading questions because this is uh, cross-examination. Uh, so she can say, isn't it true that? But the way that she's combining things together is an argumentative way to phrase a question, and they're, it's a little ticky-tacky, uh, but they're right to object, and the judge is right to sustain the objections. So when an officer is referring to dropping something in the pit or pitting it, he refers to what? Excluding it from the crime scene narrative, but that only applies to irrelevant details. We wouldn't exclude pertinent evidence. Was there anything pitted from the Lewis crime Your scene? Your Honor, objection! Evidence is logged in all the time that proves irrelevant to the discovery. It's not an intent to deceive. It's an intent we don't even to decide know for if it facts. Is anything. And to blame the prosecution She's for not coming up with every single possible detail. Okay, okay, Mrs. Anything. Florick. None of this was in the first trial. Is it your intention to pursue a new defense? Yes, Your Honor. So it's possible uh, if a judge knows that there's going to be some contentious issues that they bring the counselors into their chambers and to discuss them in person. However, it is highly unusual for either the prosecutors or the defense attorneys to yell at the judge, especially two lawyers yelling at the same time at the judge. You really don't want to piss off the judge in a criminal case uh, where the judge is presiding uh, over your case and you don't want to get on the bad side of the judge know what's going on here. Peter Florick was a corrupt and convicted state's attorney. If evidence was buried, he buried it. And now she's benefiting from his knowledge. Which still leaves you with some pages missing here. I'll give you till Monday. Yeah, if the prosecutors uh, have hidden evidence from the defense, uh, that is, is totally improper. If, if there's a missing part of a uh, police report or a coroner's report, that's not ancillary evidence. That's not a tiny, small thing that may or may not be relevant to the case. And also, the prosecutors are not the ones who are allowed to make the call as to what is relevant and what isn't relevant. That's up to the judge. So they should not have been withholding this paperwork. That is uh, that is Discovery 101, where the that information has to be turned over to the other side. You can't hide the ball against the defense like that. That's crazy. I interviewed the first jury, and they voted 11 to 1 to convict. Excuse me, that's not true. It was evenly split. No, half the jurors switched their votes when they couldn't get a troubled juror to deliberate. So I used my judgment to change strategies. And was it your judgment not to update us? So usually, in a big firm, you would have a, a senior counsel or senior partner looking over the shoulder of a junior associate handling a high-profile, high-stakes case like this criminal case here. Here, the senior partner's 
don't seem to care except that she didn't check in down the line. I mean, you can, you can have it one way or the other. You can either give your associate free reign uh, or you can help her and make sure she doesn't make horrible malpractice mistakes as she conducts this criminal defense. But man, you got to choose one, I guess. Can I have the monitors in, please? Thank you. State's attorney's here. Now, Mr. North. They're worried she's getting this stuff from her husband. There are three images. The middle is the image of the surveillance from the 15th, the night of the murder. And the one over there on the left is image from the 14th, the night before the murder. And the one on the right is from the 16th, the night after the murder. Can you see the dates on those? Oh, I guess I can. Generally, she wouldn't be able to just tell the witness that that evidence is what it is. She would have to lay the foundation that she has some basis to show that that is the case. She could uh, ask him to read the date stamps or, uh, I guess, get it admitted through the judge and, and get it stipulated that that evidence is what it says. But you can't just say, this is this and this is another thing and, and get the witness to take your word for it. Either you have a plastic bag that blows across your lot every night at 1148, or these are duplicates of the same tape. That's technically an argumentative question. I mean, it's no, actually it, it's not, not really a question like at all. I understand, sir. You didn't willfully mislead the police. Yeah, that's correct. I... No, it's just that it gets cold out there, and sometimes you don't make the circuit of the lot. Yes. So on the nights that you don't go out, you don't record the actual surveillance image. You set your computer up to duplicate the night before, just in case your manager checks it. Is that correct? Yes. Oh, Just snap, so you got lawyered, son. There is no recording the night of the murder. And you were never there to see or not see the pickup truck or the carjacker. I'm sorry. Uh, yes. So a classic Perry Mason moment where the witness recants on the stand. Here it's not a criminal defendant, but it is the star witness. And he shows that the uh, really important evidence has been doctored and it leads to the defense showing their case. I mean, that's not very realistic just because it's so rare that people actually do these kinds of uh, actions that result in uh, improper conviction. But the kind of investigation that Alicia has done here is good. She went to the particular crime scene. She uh, interviewed all the important witnesses. That's what a good lawyer does. It's like an investigation. So I think the outcome is unrealistic, but the underlying investigation is good. That's what a good attorney should do. Um, and uh, it worked out in this case, but not gonna find too many of those uh, examples in real life. So, you're wondering whether demolishing the key prosecution witness didn't just save your ass as first chair. Nice work, by the way. Thanks. But was enough for reasonable doubt. Yes! She didn't just demolish the, the prosecution's main witness. She showed him to be an outright liar. That The jury can't trust anything that man says. And she has removed a major impediment to her case, which is that the story about the red truck couldn't be corroborated. Well, the reason it couldn't be corroborated is because the prosecution's main witness was a liar. So yeah. If you're the prosecution, you should be really worried because if your star witness has just been shown to be a liar and nothing he says can be trusted, you should probably pick up your ball and go home because that that should be reasonable doubt right there. Reasonable doubt is a very high burden. And if your star witness has just been shown to be a liar and the prosecution might have been shown to be covering up evidence, well, that's that should be reasonable doubt right there. So <laughs> I think she did a good job and she has created reasonable doubt. She shouldn't be too worried about that right now. Mrs. Lewis, did you and the deceased sign a prenuptial agreement? Uh, yes, for tax purposes. So if the deceased were to divorce you, let's say in order to reunite with his first wife. Objection. Sustained. If the deceased were to divorce you, you would be cut off from his premarital savings. Is that correct? Objection. So I think that's relevant. She may not know that calls for a legal conclusion, which a lay witness can't do. But I think that the prosecutor is objecting on the basis of 
uh, relevance, which, I mean, she's laying the foundation for motive, which makes it relevant or counter motive of this, this other witness. So I don't think that's the right objection here. Also, if that is Alicia's goal here to show that another witness has a motive to commit this crime, she might as well just come out and say and, and argue against the objection, say, Your Honor, it is relevant because it goes to the motive of this witness who is a possible other suspect in this case and just come right out. And so she can plant those seeds in the, in the jury's mind uh, that all of these questions that she's going to ask go to whether this witness could also have orchestrated this crime. So she might as well just come out and say it because the more time she spends attacking this witness without the jury thinking that she's another suspect makes her look like a monster and you don't want to lose that rapport with the jury. So she might as well just make the argument and say she's another suspect in this crime. The previously unreleased trace evidence. He has also admitted into evidence the crime lab's finding that these greyhound hairs were covered in a chemical compound called alcoectolin. Have you heard of this? Sorry, the chemical? No. No, neither had I. It is a lotion. It is a lotion that is used at dog racing tracks. Objection, not in evidence. Sustained. And you might want to stay standing, Mr. Brody. I have a feeling we're nearing your smoke screen. <sighs> Mrs. Lewis. Isn't it a fact that a year ago, at the time of the murder, your brother worked at a dog track? Objection! Sustained. No further questions. So, number one, the prosecutor's objection shouldn't be sustained. That evidence should come in. Number two, uh, Alicia should come out and fight like hell so that evidence can come in. Because if she doesn't get that evidence in through another witness, the jury is going to be told to ignore everything that was struck from the record, which in this case was most of what that woman just testified to. Also, I'm not sure why she's testifying again, unless she was called as a rebuttal witness. Usually you have to ask all of your questions for a particular witness at one time. You don't get to call her back, you know, days after the, the first time you get to call her back. Uh, so there's a lot of wonkiness going on here. Yes. Thanks. Jury's in. Wait, so the, okay, so the jury came back. That's crazy because if she knows that the brother of that woman worked at the dog track and may have been the reason why there was hair, you would follow that down. So all the good investigative work that she did at the beginning of this episode uh, is totally belied by the fact that she didn't follow up on exculpatory evidence. Uh, it sounds like, I'm guessing by the way that they showed the police officer that he's done their work for them, but holy crap. You have a possible reason uh, why someone else has committed this murder, and you're not following up on it. That is not good criminal defense work. Chicago Homicide has decided to reopen its investigation into the murder of Michael Lewis. Detective Briggs, doing an admirable amount of due diligence, has confirmed that Cindy Lewis's brother Danny had access to his employer's pickup truck the week of the murder. And the dog hairs admitted into evidence match those found at his workplace. So our Damn. state's attorney, in his radiant wisdom, has decided to withdraw the charges against your client and pursue a case against Mrs. Lewis's brother. Isn't that right, Mr. Brody? All I need is a yes or no. Yes. Good. So the judge's uh, belligerence aside, prosecutors and U.S. attorneys uh, are not out there just to get convictions. They want the truth as much as anybody else. And in real life, if, the, I think, <laughs> maybe not in all cases, but probably in a case like this, if the prosecutor learned of true exculpatory evidence and strong evidence that someone else was responsible for a crime as heinous as murder, they would have no problem at all dropping the charges against this person and pursuing those charges against the other uh, suspect. The prosecutors have wide discretion as to what cases they bring, when they end those cases, when they withdraw those cases, and when they bring those cases against somebody else. So it makes absolute sense that the prosecutor would drop their case against this poor woman and then pursue the case against this brother figure who uh, it seems actually committed this murder. And there wouldn't be this hemming and hawing by this, uh, this prosecutor here. He would drop the case and go against the other person. And we're done here. We're done here. Good job, Alicia. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, that was The Good Wife. That was pretty good. I enjoyed that a lot. 
they uh, are better on objections than most legal TV shows. The facts are totally unrealistic. Uh, this happens over the span of like three days when in reality it probably would have taken months for this trial to proceed. They were calling back witnesses when they had already been examined. However, uh, a lot of the legal uh, argument that was made was good. Um, the investigation that the main character undertook was good. She was saved by the sort of deus ex machina. But still, nonetheless, uh, a better than average legal drama. So I would give The Good Wife a solid B for accuracy. You're on the right track. Do better next time. So if you like this video, let me know about what show I should do next in the comments, and check out this playlist that I put together, which compiles a lot of my other reaction videos. Uh, so check out this playlist, and I'll see you in the next one.